or good afternoon on the East Coast. Um, we're going to talk about business opportunities for contractors and water efficiency. I'm talking to you from the offices of Glumac Consulting Engineers in Sacramento, California. And I am Jerry Udelson of Udelson Associates in Tucson. I'm a professional engineer and the author of a number of books about green building. I also work on green projects, so I think I'm pretty well grounded. And uh, what I want to do today is to talk to you about really three things uh, as you see here in key takeaways. I want to talk to you about why I think water is the next big thing in the green movement and sort of the links between water and energy. I want to talk about maybe some international experience and technology that we can adapt here in the U.S. And then I want to talk about opportunities for contractors in retrofits, rainwater harvesting, graywater and blackwater systems, cooling towers, and water system management. The first thing I like to do is give a, a kind of a broad perspective on why I think water is the next big green thing. As you can kind of see in the next slide, um, water is really going to become the oil of the 21st century. And what I mean by that is that water is going to be the source of conflict, it's going to be a source of wealth, and it's going to be a source of opportunity, much as uh, oil and natural gas were in the 20th century. Um, unlike energy, the fresh water supply is inherently limited. I'll show you a little bit about that. We're uh, still growing and urbanizing as a global population, and we'll have to add something in excess of 2 billion people and feed them by 2050. And in the U.S., as some of you may know, if you look at demographics, we're set to add another 100 million people over the next 40 years. So that water will become a continuous issue, and so opportunities are there. Uh, global warming or global climate change has an impact on water, and I'll, I'll show you something about that. Um, and we know, uh, if you look at the situation even in Texas right now, in South Texas, with all the fires going on, all of that's a result of huge droughts. And so much of the U.S., particularly the southern tier, from Florida all the way across to the entire state of California, has experienced significant droughts since 2006, which means that extreme water conservation measures are now much more acceptable and are likely to be employed by government. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the distinction between water conservation and water efficiency. So let's take a look at why water is the oil of the 21st century. Next slide. Thank you. Um, if you look at this chart, this is worldwide water use in thousands of cubic kilometers. So you could see round numbers that we use about a thousand square mi cubic miles of water, and most of it's going to agriculture, or it's inefficiently going to agriculture to uh, feed people around the planet. What's happened is that as a result of this, there's just huge resource conflicts all over the world, and if you think about it logically, every uh, boundary between countries, and in the U.S., many boundaries between states are rivers. Well, rivers have to be managed on both sides of the boundary, but without the same political subdivisions, there's going to be conflicts. So upstream conflicts with downstream, etc. Our existing surface water sources are fully allocated and much of the groundwater is allocated. So we don't have a lot of new resource to work with. And water will be the next battleground worldwide as well as in the U.S. between urban and rural interests. And you can see why this is true just looking at how much water use goes to agriculture. So in the next slide, I want to talk about how limited fresh water is, and I use this graphic of the Garden of Eden just to show that we haven't had any more water made since Adam and Eve. Uh, if you think about energy, the whole history of development the last two or three hundred years has been about discovering more and more sources of energy, but water has not grown in that whole period. 
The usable fresh water is a tiny fraction of the total water on Earth. I'll show you that in the chart in a minute. Much of it's too polluted to drink. This is certainly the case in the developing world where something like two billion people don't have access to clean water on a daily basis. And even in the U.S., many areas depend on aquifer depletion um, as well. So with respect to population growth, if you look at a place like China, China's adding the equivalent of one New York City metropolitan area per year to its urban population. And if you look at what's happening in the world is everyone wants to eat more meat, and you look at the water footprint of food, you see that it takes a huge amount of water to grow beef, lamb, and poultry compared to the traditional cereal grains, uh, et cetera. Um, India is growing fast. So huge stress in the water system unless we make changes. So in the next slide, you just keep your cursor there, Katie, so you can advance them faster. Um, we're going to look at the impact of global warming or global climate change on water supply. And um, the chart shows you the cost of water in different countries. So you see actually the countries in northern Europe where water is fairly plentiful have the highest cost for water, which is the inverse of the U.S. where in general we still have low cost of water even though we have water shortage issues. But what's happened is in the summertime we depend on snow melt and river flow for much of our water supply. And changes in weather, particularly uh, in the west coast here in Nevada and the Rockies, mean that there's less snowpack, higher spring runoff, greater floods, lower summer stream flows, all of which means that summertime droughts are going to become a bigger and bigger issue, which means water conservation funding will increase to deal with those issues. And then, of course, water pricing will be the next big sector. So you can see in Germany, they're paying three times per unit what we do for water. And what's happening throughout the western U.S. and in other areas is that the cost of water now is being increased dramatically as you use more of it. And this has not been a historical pattern. The historical pattern has been as you use more water, it gets cheaper. But that's not the case anymore. So there's going to be a huge economic push for conservation. We also have to consider energy supply. You know, it's funny, but hydropower still supplies significant energy use in the U.S., even though it's, you know, 50 to 100 years old. Um, water supply itself requires energy for pumping, treatment, and disposal. In fact, in California, almost 20% of the entire electric power consumption goes to um, water issues. So a huge connection between energy shortages and water shortages. And most of our energy comes from thermal power plants, which require water for cooling. So you can see that we have this connection between water and energy called the water energy nexus, which means that these things are going to have to be planned in tandem going forward. Next slide. Uh, major droughts in the U.S., in the U.S., Atlanta, South Texas, South Florida, California, Nevada, um, Arizona, where I live, uh, has been spared for the most part. In Australia, they went through a four-year drought that uh, affected nearly every major city because in Australia, almost 80 percent of the population lives on or near the coastline. And you can see what happened to Australia's largest river, the Murray-Darling system. Um, that feeds uh, Melbourne, Sydney, and so forth, and Adelaide uh, almost dried up as, as time went along in the uh, 2005 to 2009 period. So in the next slide, I want to talk about the distinction between water conservation and water efficiency and why this has an impact for contractors. Conservation very simply means less total use. And efficiency is a way to get conservation but doesn't guarantee it. And one of the examples that I like to use is if you use a public toilet in an airport, you realize that every time you lean forward, it flushes. So one use might generate three flushes. So you have a device in the way of a sensor that's meant to be efficient and make sure it gets flushed after every use, which actually is an anti-conservation device. Um, 
So what's really important is behavior modification. Uh, so people use less water to get what they need. Pricing is important. Education, regulation, they all have a role. Um, and, and some water conservation is counterproductive. For example, in western cities and desert cities where it's hot and dry a good part of the year, lots of green spaces. We, we take out green space because we don't want to get the water use. But lots of green spaces can be counterproductive. It drives up the urban heat island effect and forces cooling towers to run more and use more water. So what have you gained? Um, we occasionally have issues with sewers that don't flush because the water conservation is too strong upstream. And we're seeing research, although we don't have definitive data, on an issue called drain line carry, which means if I cut all the water use in an office building or, or cut it down 60, 70, 80 percent, am I getting enough uh, water in the drain line to actually flush the paper, et cetera, through the line? So conservation and efficiency often can work against each other. It's something to keep in mind when you're looking at opportunities. Next slide. So water conservation is really a virtual reservoir. Um, it's much cheaper than new, new water supplies. It's much faster to bring online. It's proven and creates what the president likes to call shovel-ready uh, uh, outcomes by creating a virtual reservoir. So that's one way to think about it and one way to talk about it to get local water authorities to actually implement strong conservation programs. And certainly essential for future water supply planning because we simply can't rely on surface water transfers and increased groundwater pumping uh, to meet our water needs. And it's implementable in a very short period of time compared to trying to bring a new water supply source online. One of the examples I include in my book called Dry Run, Preventing the Next Urban Water Crisis, which I'll show you a cover shot of later in the show, um, came out last year. I did a lot of research on Australia really the driest continent there is. 20 million people live there. And what's happened is that global climate change, particularly for Western and Southern Australia, has moved the storm track south towards Antarctica, and Western Australia got really dry. So in places like Perth, which is the most isolated big city in the world, 80% um, reduction in reservoir inflows was below historical levels. When well, you try to deal with that as a water supply manager, all you can do is cut in the short run. In addition, with higher temperatures and lower flows, you get more stagnant water and more dengue fever from mosquitoes. So this sort of uh, water set of issues has lots of consequences beyond just water supply itself. Next. And you can see uh, very quickly in this chart, the red indicates the lowest on record the sort of pinkish red, very much below average. And if you look on the chart in the west, kind of southwestern Australia and all along the southern southeastern coast and all the way up to Brisbane in the um, semi-tropical area, you see that in 2009, um, water flows over the preceding 12 years were actually at the lowest on record, the same for Tasmania. So. Again, you have a modern economy dependent on water for so many different things and yet having to deal with this extreme drought. On the other hand, you see where nobody lives up in the tropics and in some parts of the interior, the highest rainfall on record. So you'll see this in the water supply situation everywhere where water flows where it's not needed and doesn't flow where it is needed. And so conservation becomes one of the very quick response tools. Next slide. And inflows near Perth, I mentioned that reservoir inflows compared to historic levels in the 2001, 2003 to 2007, 8 period were about 80% below historical levels. Again, indicating that you've got to take drastic action. Well, what did they actually do? Next slide.
So what happened was there was a coordinated response by uh, the national and state governments. Because they run on a parliamentary system instead of our um, divided responsibility between executive and legislative function, they can actually move quickly when there's a real problem. And so they crafted a $13 billion plan. That's not a lot uh, per person, about $650 per person on 20 million people. Um, excuse me, $650,000 per person, I should say. Um, water restrictions hit all urban areas. So um, there, there's certainly a, a, a need to think about Adelaide had a 50% reduction in use. If you think about a major American city um, having to have a 50% reduction in a two or three year period, and it basically means you have to stop watering anything out of doors. So gardens, lawns, landscaping, um, everything went down. And I think that's just what you have to do. But they got their water use uh, down to uh, 34 gallons per day per capita. The US average is 150. So you could see we got lots of opportunities to reduce energy use. Um, 200,000 retrofits in the state of Victoria alone, where Melbourne is. In addition, they created a water efficiency labeling system that is mandatory for all product sales since 2006, so shower sinks, toilet journals. We have a, a EPA water sense program, but it's voluntary at this point. So I think you're going to begin to see mandatory conservation. That's something everybody likes to see, which is federal mandates. But certainly a need that is going to happen first at the state level. And therefore, uh, the first thing will be new product sales, but then there'll be retrofit requirements. So again, I would start gearing up for the mandatory retrofit in, in places like uh, Dallas, Austin, uh, Denver, uh, many California cities, um, Atlanta. You're going to start to see many opportunities for mandatory conservation and therefore retrofits. Um, product innovation, so paddle showers that you can just flip a little switch and cut off flow, the so-called Navy shower, and uh, they develop waterless car washing kits. So lots of innovations are going to hit the market. Next. What was interesting about Australia to me was that the plumbing industry was front and center as part of the solution. And not only the plumbing industry and manufacturers, but also the unionized uh, union plumbers and the unionized plumbing contractors. So um, certainly something we're beginning to see in the US. In fact, they created the Green Plumber Training, which was licensed from the uh, plumbing industry in uh, Melbourne area. And um, they created a, a sort of climate change training center. Um, the larger water utilities are big now into water recycling. So uh, Western Australia has a 30% goal of using water twice, or maybe even more, uh, versus 13% now. You're starting to see homes being outfitted with essentially purple pipe to recycle water. And a plant in Sydney already supplies 500 million gallons a year, and it's set to double directly uh, to the household sector. Um, the public is cooperating. So the, in southeastern Queensland, where Brisbane is a large city, um, we've been able to see water use reductions in half. They didn't start at our levels. They started at um, about 70 gallons a day, about half of the US average. Um, and the other thing that's happening, desalination is being seen as a viable option or supplemental water supply, whereas it's still a hard sell in the US. The only plant I know that's under construction now is in San Diego County. But you're going to begin to see desalination being more and more relied upon by coastal cities. Um, I think the largest US plant is actually in Tampa, in Florida. But since so much of our population lives near the coast, we're going to begin to see desalination um, seen particularly as some of the newer technologies cut energy use in half for the same amount of water production is going to become much more economically viable. So next slide. 
And I thought because we're all uh, contractors here, I would throw in a plumbing diagram for a modern office building so you could see um, rainwater and also recovery of fire uh, hydrant and, and fire flow testing water, uh, a first flush diverter to get the bird poop out of the rainwater, um, rainwater then being used as a supply for irrigation, outdoor taps, or um, um, and, and or outdoor hose pits, and toilets, and then uh, discharge of excess of the storm water, that's sort of the top chart. And then you could see uh, hot water, potable water coming in, gray water from showers and hand basins going into a gray water treatment unit, that being fed back into the rainwater tank, uh, and then used to flush toilets and, and for outdoor irrigation. Um, and then things like kitchen sinks, cleaning sinks, uh, still as normal going to the sewer as with waterless or water for urinals. So um, you're beginning to see the development of more piping, more plumbing, more pumps, valves, controls. So again, more action for the contractor as we start to um, try to recycle, reuse, downcycle in office buildings. <clears throat> and somewhat the same for residential. Um, you can have gray water treatment. I have that in my home in uh, Tucson, Arizona, going to subsurface irrigation, which you can do in Arizona without a permit. Um, we're going to begin to see that as a, a, a thing happening in homes, at least stub out for gray water. So Tucson City now has in their new home ordinance that every home has to have a stub out for gray water from the bathroom, which means you can pick up the bathtub and shower and the sink water, uh, put it through some sort of treatment system, and then, um, as you wish, use it for subsurface irrigation. And this, go back, please. And the same with uh, rainwater. Uh, I have rainwater collection tanks, which I use for subsurface irrigation. And you can also think that that might be um, collected and used on a more community scale as new communities are built, as townhome communities are built, uh, apartment houses, and so forth. So again, opportunities to um, uh, put in more piping, more plumbing, more valves, more controls, so more opportunity for contractors. Next. In Australia, they've also developed a significant interest in sewer mining. And the idea here is you take the sewage that's already running down the middle of the street, so to speak, and you take it into an office building. Here's a, a city or public office building in Melbourne that I've been to that actually takes the um, <clears throat> uh, sewage, brings it into the building, treats it, because after all, it's 98% water. Um, and uses it for cooling tower makeup and toilet flushing, uh, and then returns it to the sewer system. So in certain places and in certain climates, you're seeing an interest in on-site blackwater treatment, particularly with build own operate schemes, where it's a third party builder, owner, operator. Um, I participated in a project in Portland, Oregon, which until recently was the world's largest lead platinum building where there's on-site black water treatment, and it was actually paid for by the reduction in impact fees or hookup fees to the storm sewer and sanitary sewer system. So by not having to connect to those systems and getting the agreement of the city to not charge the fees, even though you weren't connected, um, that was able to fund the initial capital cost. So upfront, no additional cost, and you're still paying the same for water but you're getting a lot more water conservation. Next. So uh, lessons learned in a crisis, everything's on the table. So we all know in our political system, it takes a crisis to get things done. Um, easier to do in their political system, but still everything has to be negotiated. Um, their system favors big long-term solutions like desalination and delivery, a sort of toilet to tap programs, if you will, um, harder sell in the US, I think, until there's a real emergency. Um, you've got to have public participation because people like their lawn and garden. And so you have to, over time, shift the 
you know, landscaping from uh, lots of lawn to more native and adapted plants. You've got to deal with personal habits of water use. Um, you know, in a crisis, you can mandate new technology. So water sense labeled technology, I suspect, will be mandated before long in certain places. And you can try exotic solutions like toilet to tap, so to speak, like desalination, and evaluate them because people know they're in a real fix. Next. In Canada, I just want to bring people's attention to a really nice mixed-use uh, project uh, called Dockside Green in Victoria, British Columbia, um, which is exploring how to do close to a zero water system, even in a fairly wet climate. So this is a development where every building is committed to be lead platinum. And they've already finished the first phase build out. So you can see in the next slide how the, the thinking goes. A little bit hard to read, I realize. But the whole idea here is to integrate stormwater, wastewater treatment, rainwater collection, and harvesting into a system that feeds green roofs, that uh, feeds bioswales. So when you're starting with a very large development, so if you're looking at large mixed-use projects or large new residential developments or uh, large new school campuses, you're going to see more and more interest in a total water system solution. Next slide. And here you can see it a little bit clearer. Um, there is a membrane bioreactor, so that technology, which is available from GE and I think some other sources, um, you're going to see membrane bioreactors, filtration, storage, bioswales to do the final polishing. Um, you're going to see green roofs, et cetera, toilets flush with reused water. So quite a bit of dual piping here uh, to get that um, system to work. And quite a bit for contractors to learn about how to hook up to on-site uh, waste treatment systems, which historically has not been in the normal PHCC contractor toolkit. Next. You can see a, a close-up of, of the system. Um, lots of opportunities for landscaping and black water treatment um, and so forth. So again, Works easier in Canada just because of different public mentality, but certainly can be done a lot of places in the U.S. Another uh, black water treatment system is the Vancouver British Columbia Convention Center, which is a um, was actually the press headquarters for the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver. Um, used for toilet flushing, uh, landscape irrigation, and so forth. So. If you're ever in a mood to visit British Columbia, there's some nice projects to go look at. Next. And we're starting to see gray water systems. So here's a larger scale gray water 5,000 gallon tank um, that can deliver uh, quite a bit of recycled gray water and also use treated rainwater. So I think we're going to begin to see a lot of innovation in tanks in dimensions in availability and you know basically trying to do package gray water where you can next slide uh, also opportunities a little more exotic uh, for urine separating composting toilets so you start to do if you do projects in more rural areas visitor centers at parks and so forth where they want to do composting toilets boy scout camps all that kind of stuff you're going to start to see some of these uh, ideas to separate urine from solid waste, just compost the solid waste and recycle the nitrogen in the urine to plant. So, you know, this is a, still on the cutting edge of stuff, but you can see the opportunity. Um, so here's a, a, an example. I just want to tell you what the picture shows. There are a lot of these new kind of storage systems, which are based on interlocking uh, plastic dividers, where you put down a clay or a barrier layer, and you very quickly can get uh, tens of thousands of gallons of storage. 
Here's Jacksonville Naval Air Station in Florida where they're actually doing rainwater harvesting to wash down aircraft. And if any of you have been in the Air Force or Naval Air Service, you know the aircraft is kept clean. Um, and so why not take an aircraft hangar with a lot of rain in Florida on the roof, capture that rainfall, which is pretty constant throughout the year, store it and use it for plane washing. So really nice sort of uh, way to think about things. In Germany, the largest country, go back please. In Germany, the largest country in Europe, uh, not growing, uh, but about 80 million people has um, now cranked up their renewable energy use to over 20% in 2010 of total electricity supply. Uh, but in addition to thinking about global warming and the effects of global climate change, remember most of the rivers in Germany are fed by the Alps. So you're going to, as you start to see snowpack diminishing, you're going to have summer water uh, shortages in parts of Germany. Um, so a real focus on rainwater harvesting. It's in all the regulations now. Um, and new applications for gray water reuse. Um, I went to a very large new bank building in Frankfurt as part of my book research and was able to see packaged gray water systems being used quite nicely in commercial applications. Okay. Here's an example. This is made by Hans Groa, or you may know them as Groa, G-R-O-H-E, the U.S. company, which in the U.S. is a unit of um, uh, one of the large sort of um, residential building supply firms. Uh, but here is a packaged gray water system with four chambers. And it answers the need for office buildings, which is for batch treatment, because you have a uh, 100 or more days a year when an office building is not being occupied. So it can't really work on a continuous flow system. So this is designed as a package unit. You can see in the next chart, uh, next slide, how it works. Um, it, it has a pre-filtration part to take out coarser particles uh, and, and to get treat them automatically and to put them in the wastewater system. Um, biological treatment in two stages, aerobic and anaerobic. Removal of sediment, biological sludge. So this is very similar to a sewage treatment plant but on a micro level. And then UV disinfection. So uh, can then be stored in the normal storage sense. So really a nice nice approach, very simple, and is being manufactured on a mass scale. Next. And here you can sort of see a cutaway of the system. This is designed for um, 4,500 liters a day, about 1,000 gallons per day. Uh, but you can gang these up. They're very they're, um, modular, so you can actually put in as many as you want. So again, a pretty nice system. So gray water is pretty constant because it goes as building occupancy, if you just think about sinks and showers. Um, uh, in an office building, a uh, pretty constant amount of water, not huge amounts, but you can capture and reuse that. Next. Again, you could see them ganged up. So uh, I think uh, what I saw was a three tank system. So. Uh, you know, about 3,000 gallons a day of treatment, which should be enough for most large buildings. And you can send it out to toilet flushing, um, cleaning, and um, uh, landscape. Bye. Uh, next slide, please. So what's driving all this? Obviously, water shortages and droughts have captured people's attention. Uh, incentive programs for water efficient fixtures. Just about any time a water agency in the U.S. offers to pay you to put in a water efficient toilet, those programs are oversubscribed uh, usually within days. It's the same way with the refrigerator incentive program. Anything that's put up where people can see a return on investment quickly um, or an opportunity to upgrade their, their fixtures gets subscribed in a hurry. Well, the nice part is every one of those things needs to be installed by a plumber. Um, green certification programs, LEED, LEED for existing buildings. You know, LEED just certified their 10,000th commercial building, a non-residential building. And that's the equivalent of about one and a half billion with a B square feet. 
it turns out that more buildings, existing buildings, have been certified now than new buildings. So again, tremendous retrofit opportunities. LEED requires for the LEED for existing building operation and maintenance, or LEED EBOM system, LEED requires 20% water savings against the baseline. So again, opportunities for contractors to do fixture retrofits, put in purple pipe systems on, on gut uh, renovations and so forth. Rising costs. In Southern California, between, go back please. In Southern California, I'm sorry, we're here. Uh, in Southern California, um, water supply and sewage treatment costs are going up about 10% a year. 50% program gain over five years. So I always think that economic, economics drives change. Higher water costs, higher tiered water costs drive change. Stakeholder concern, California cities, for example, by state law are under a mandate to cut overall water use 20% per capita between 2008 and 2020. They're only going to do that with massive retrofit programs. So again, opportunities. Next. And so things are inhibiting as well as driving. Water is still cheap. Uh, the water bill in an urban office building is about one-tenth the energy bill. Uh, high water use lifestyles are still preferred. There are some unintended consequences. Uh, since most of our uh, sewage, um, uh, sewerage system is based on self-cleaning uh, through just the way they're sloped, uh, cutting water flows may have some impact on that. Uh, the bigger issue is that if I if I use less water, the water or sewer agents, agency gets less money, and therefore they have to hike rates. Well, in in fact, that leads to political uh, pushback. At the same time, it gives a greater incentive for cutting water use. So you, you kind of have these things. Um, codes need to change. In Oregon, um, the state plumbing board has now made statewide gray water, not a code exception, but a complete alternative pathway that's code compliant. So you don't have to worry about the local official not having, uh, not being up to speed or not wanting this to happen. It's totally in the code. And I believe this is now spread to about 17 states. Uh, rainwater, the same thing. People want to keep rainwater um, separate from the drinking water supply, totally understandable but no reason why I can't flush toilets. It just means you've got to have dual water systems. And then efficiency devices that don't work uh, are a big inhibitor. So I always think that the biggest inhibitor is that we've never had to think about water supply before in the last 30, 40, 50 years. And we don't have a way to think in whole systems. And just to give you one example from the building business, as most of you know, if you work in commercial new construction, the mechanical and plumbing engineer stops five feet out from the building. The civil engineer picks it up from there. The landscape architect only worries about water use outside the building. The architect who's in charge of the whole system probably doesn't think about water at all. And so there's no unifying force to force whole systems thinking. And I think that is an opportunity area, particularly in design, build, mechanical, and plumbing, where you can force this kind of thinking and bring in whole integrated solutions that you would then design and install. Next. Interesting developments. I mentioned this project in passing. You can go see it if you're in Portland. But this has, uh, was built in 2004 and 5. Reduces water use against the um, code of 55%. It's a lead platinum project. But more importantly, it's a developer project, meaning all the leases were signed before design began. There was a fixed budget, and it was built to suit for a medical, a group of medical tenants. So the water use had to respond to all of those. So you can see in the next slide what the project did was design a integrated water system where uh, rainfall feeds firewater storage as well as infiltrated groundwater. So this had a high water table and uh, did need to be dewatered. So they took advantage of it not only for fire storage, but 
but also for radiant cooling, which is another whole subject in of itself. They use it for cooling tower uh, makeup water, uh, treated black water, um, uh, and essentially, uh, except for the solids removal, all the black water is recycled. And then non-potable rainwater was used for toilet flushing, uh, outdoor irrigation, and uh, a cooling tower makeup. Next. And so here's a, a, a schematic of the system. Um, you could see everything ran through the fire storage tank. Uh, cooling tower makeup uh, was about one and a half million gallons a year. Fixture use about 1.7, which needed, of course, fresh water. Um, irrigation was about one million gallons a year. And in the future, they expected 1.2 million gallons a year for irrigation around the site. And so they bought. Um, a toilet. They bought 3.3 million gallons a year of water from the city. Used that for toilets and, and sink where they needed it. Uh, and you can see the whole thing is sort of recycled. But the key is nothing went to the sanitary sewer, and some stuff went out into the landscape and bioswales and wetlands for further um, biological treatment and disposal. So again, you're seeing opportunities in the biological treatment area, which I'll show you in a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. And again, you can see sort of another schematic of the bioreactor, uh, pretreatment, processing, anaerobic digestion, aerobic digestion, sludge disposal, 1,500 gallons a week, so through the honey bucket truck, um, UV disinfection, temporary storage, and then building water use. Next. Uh, there is a technology out to simulate natural tidal action, where the idea originally came from, from a Florida company called Worrell Water Technologies. You're starting to see this come in. It's called a living machine into urban office buildings. Um, and so you'll begin to see more of this. You may want to read up on it, uh, find them on the web. But again, if you just think about this technology, the water has to get there somehow. It has to be returned somehow to use, which is all about piping, valves, controls, etc. So again, there's a contractor in there somewhere making this happen. Next. Again, you could sort of see the um, water sources. There's a lot of tanks. Um, so again, the wetlands are there doing the polishing, but there is an opportunity for um, the contractor throughout this process. Next. There's also a thing called the Living Building, the Living Building Challenge, which I call Lead on Steroids. Um, but the whole idea is zero net annual water, uh, water use. And you're starting to see buildings acquire this um, Living Building Certification, including a very large office building to start a construction in Seattle. And so it does use some well water, but for the most part survives uh, well water for drinking um, with a, and, 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 and rainwater, um, but does survive on zero net water use. So we're seeing lots of buildings come in with zero net energy use. You're starting to see zero net water use. So again, um, opportunity areas. So next. Um, building fixture retrofits, a lot of uh, opportunity in the energy sector for what's called ESCO financing or third-party financing and install. I did find one company in Florida that's in the, that's in the book that's doing this for uh, water uh, fixture retrofits, particularly where you have a lot of older office buildings with five-gallon per flush fixtures. You can actually make money by retrofitting them, particularly if there's some public money involved our water system money, um, and essentially just charging for water use. Uh, the whole idea here is to design for specific uses that don't require potables. You can see in the diagram that um, a lot of uses in a building don't require potable use, probably half uh, in a building or home. So again, separating out things according to levels of quality, um, and new applications. 
So the next next slide. So you went the wrong direction. There you go. Go forward. So where do this leave contractors? Uh, very dynamic future. There's water shortages driving your business. New laws and regulations. Uh, increased pricing for water. Certain mandates such as retrofit upon resale. Um, lots of opportunity in the on-site waste treatment. Opportunities for design build operate systems. Um, but larger questions that haven't been resolved yet. You know, should we abandon? to some degree the centralized supply and treatment model that we've built up over the last 50 to 75 years. Um, should we still flush toilets with potable water? How will new technologies be tested and certified? So some of you may know the history of water free urinals hasn't been entirely glitch free. So you sort of wonder how will all this stuff be tested and certified going forward. Next. Challenges, you've got to do your homework. You've got to decide where and how to position yourself in the marketplace, how you're going to learn about these new technology systems and approaches, how you're going to stay up with all the products coming on the market, and larger questions of benefit and cost, such as who's going to pay for all this. Next. Early possibilities, I think water audits are a great way to get started, both commercial and, and uh, residential. Get yourself trained as a green plumber. Uh, learn about the solar uh, hot water part of this business. Look at building fixture retrofits, particularly encourage the local water agencies to fund those. In Singapore, they have what they call new water which is they're actually taking their recycled sewage and put it directly into the reservoirs for potable water. That's a little bit radical, but Singapore is 5 million people on a small island um, getting half their water from a neighbor in Malaysia that's not always friendly, so they have to do what they can. New subspecialties, irrigation water use, learning how to navigate the cloud for water efficiency, uh, monitoring, metering, measuring, control. Uh, so all kinds of business in sub-metering. So you could think about sub-metering cooling towers, sub-metering major water uses, such as irrigation. So every time there's a meter, there's, there's a contractor in there somewhere. Um, and to use more non-potable water projects. So that certainly, again, opportunities. Next. So my conclusion, the future is green, but if you want to score, you got to run to where the ball is headed, not to where it is right now. Um, trying to find out wherever you do business, how will cities, building owners, homeowners manage water in 2015, try to get ahead of the curve. What's going to be the new normal? Is drought going to be the new normal for water supply? Um, Will there be a penalty to pay for non-green water wasting buildings and homes in a drought condition uh, if you go to resell? Um, so you have to think about those issues. Where does that leave you as a business? Next slide. So we have about five minutes to go. Um, I do publish a lot um, in various places, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, SlideShare. So if you want to stay up with what I'm doing, those are opportunities. Next slide. And I do have a um, next slide, please. Sorry, I apologize. Did I lose? Crashed. Oh, your computer crashed. It's OK. So um, you can also reach me through PHCC, the uh, URL. Just look up Gary Udelson, and you'll find the URL for my um, a website and newsletter. But we have about five minutes left. If there are any questions that people have, um, I can see them on the screen. Deborah says, I grew up in Australia. And the city that used to be like Portland is now more like Las Vegas, dry as can be, huge growth of rainwater harvesting, gray water. And now it's very common practice to install a large rainwater catchment tank or two in every new home. I have two in my home. So um, what will it take to have Arizona residents have the same change of view when their water is so cheap? 
You know, it's funny. I live in Tucson, which is so different than Phoenix. Tucson's about a million people, metro area. And native desert landscaping is what is done. In fact, the city of Tucson prohibits you from putting in a lawn in a new apartment building, for example. And so it's really a Sonoran Desert chic in just about every place you go. You go to Phoenix, 100 miles away to the north, a much hotter, uh, lower desert, and they still flood irrigate lawns a couple times a week. And the lawns actually are a few inches below the curb. So um, I would say where you live is very cultural. And I think in Tucson, the culture has definitely been, we're in, we're in a desert, we're going to live here a long time in the desert. And in Phoenix, it's been, you know, hey, somehow we'll always have the political cloud to get the water we need. Um, but, you know, I see that slowly changing. But don't forget, even when you don't live in a desert, much of Southern California is effectively a desert. It has less than 20 inches a year rainfall. Most of the U.S. west of the 100th meridian, which is roughly the middle of Kansas and Nebraska, is effectively less than 20 inches a year, which is a drought climate. So it's not just Arizona that we have to think about. It's all of Texas. Even in the southeast, where you think there's a lot of rainfall, Atlanta was 30 days away from running out of water in 2007. So it doesn't take much to run out of water. If you think about Florida, 25 million people, the highest point in Florida is 300 feet. There's no place to put a reservoir. So they have to rely on rainfall and capturing it from the groundwater. Well, what happens if all of a sudden everyone's tapping the same groundwater resource? So the bottom line is water shortages are in our future. Opportunities for contractors are there. And the political and economic incentives are getting put in place to make people want to do this. So that's why I think there's tremendous opportunity. And um, we're reaching the end of our time. So I'm going to sign off now, turn it back to Katie. But I want to thank people for being on the call. And you will have access to all these slides. be very happy to talk to you individually. You can reach me by email. And um, she'll tell you about what's coming up. So once again, Thanks to PHCC for sponsoring this, and thanks to you all for attending. Thank you, Jerry. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar, New Business Opportunities in Water Conservation and Reuse, on behalf of the PHCC Educational Foundation. I'd like to first thank Jerry Udelson from Udelson Associates for speaking today. I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Reed Manufacturing, 